Okay, now I think uh, we have enough people coming. Uh, so welcome everyone. Today we are very happy to have uh, Susan Billick uh, to give us the seminar. Uh, Susan Billick is a professor of geophysics at New Mexico Tech. And for those who may not be very familiar with New Mexico Tech, uh, it is located in the city of Socorro, about 90 miles south of uh, Albuquerque in New Mexico. Uh, Susan obtained her uh, bachelor degree in geosciences from Penn State University in 1996 and her PhD degree in geophysics from UC St. Cruz in 2001. After two years of postdoc at the University of Michigan, she joined the Earth and Environmental Science Department at New Mexico Tech uh, since 2003. Susan's research focuses on using earthquake signals to understand uh, 14 conditions of global subduction zones, as well as using local earthquakes in central New Mexico to study the mid-crustal uh, Socorro magma body. Susan is also engaged in the growing field of mental seismology, uh, which she will present to us today. And Susan has also been heavily involved in the Aries Pascal facility that is hosted at New Mexico Tech and managing the New Mexico seismology, uh, Seismic Network. So welcome Susan and please take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, and I'll, 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 one correction, I think the, the use of the word city for Socorro is, is generous. It's a, <laughs> a pretty small town for those of you that have been <laughs> through Socorro. <laughs> um, we have a population of about 10,000 people. So it's a, yeah, small place. All right. So let me turn off some things here. Okay. So, um, First, I wanted to thank you all for the invitation uh, to give the seminar today uh, and to introduce some of the work that I've been doing with many others to apply seismic data and methods to look at uh, very shallow and surface processes associated with water and bed load transport. Um, the pictures here, uh, the one in the top left is just me installing a seismometer in the swamps of Florida. <laughs> Um, and then there's a photo and a video of uh, a flood that's happening within our local ephemeral tributary. And so both of these will be areas that I'll be talking about today. So um, I know some people here today uh, through some of my work uh, that I've done over the last several years on subduction zone earthquake source processes. So from the giant tsunami producing events to the smaller earthquakes related to seamount subduction. And while earthquakes are always gonna be my first love, um, in recent years, I've gotten involved in several shallow hydrology projects associated with some of the faculty in our department's strong hydrology group. And so it's these watery projects that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and I wanna start that journey just by highlighting the large number of uh, faculty and student collaborators um, that have been important partners in the work. Um, and so many of them you can see here on the slides. Um, lots of field work uh, has been involved with these uh, couple of projects. And so we've had an army of students that have been out um, in the field helping. And many of the figures that I'm gonna present here today uh, have been produced through various theses and dissertation work by several of these students. And I'm trying to call out them as much as I can. But first um, we'll get started by uh, doing a brief review of environmental seismology. So we'll simply define it as a way to exploit the seismic records of various shallow and superficial processes in order to better understand those processes. And so the figure here on the right is from a nice review paper by Burton et al, um, which shows seismograms and the corresponding spectrograms recorded uh, for the ground motions that are recorded as a result of a variety of different processes from rock slides to debris flows to um, bed load transport and rivers. And the seismograms themselves look different than what we would expect the seismogram to look like for a typical earthquake. Um, and the frequency content 
in, involved in um, these signals are also different than what we see for a typical earthquake. And that frequency content can be useful to help distinguish between the different processes. Um, there are other processes that can produce ground vibrations, um, some of them listed here, like ocean storms, glacier movements. Um, there are lots of others. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is some of the work that we're doing to characterize bed load transport uh, during the southwestern United States monsoon seasons, um, as well as some water flowing through a karst aquifer system. So um, I'll start with the application for applying seismic uh, methods to understand how bed load is transported in river systems. Uh, and this is an important area, or important issue in earth sciences, as it touches on a variety of things such as landscape evolution, erosion, and practical concerns about river management. And so various methods and data are used uh, to characterize transport, some within the channel, some outside of the channel. Um, and I'm going to focus on using some seismic information to help characterize the process. So one of the earlier applications for applying seismic data to bed load transport um, is nicely shown in this figure. Um, this comes from data that was collected uh, in an experiment in the Himalaya mountains. Um, they had an experiment that was deployed for tectonic purposes, but they characterized signals that um, they associated with changes in water flow along a large mountain river where the station was located. Um, and in this case, this spectrogram uh, is taken over a year time period, clearly shows a period of higher power. And that period of, of higher power corresponds to the time series or the time period of the summer monsoon rains. Um, and you can see that you know, that higher power is over a frequency range of about five to about 15 Hertz. Further analysis of this data suggested that the power in that frequency band also varied within the monsoon season, where you had um, in this figure on the right, you have um, the, the power at different time periods and different amounts of water in the river and that they're, that's varying over time. And what they found was that you had higher power earlier in the monsoon season relative to later in the monsoon season, even at the same level of water in the river. Um, and they attributed this to the river having more material to move in the beginning of the monsoon season relative to later in the season, thus providing some evidence for uh, bed load transport captured with the seismic data. So um, we can look at the data that's been collected for um, the seismic, uh, the seismic data collected um, and related to bed load transport. Um, and with that, uh, various models have been suggested uh, to help predict bed load transport from that seismic data. Um, and this is, uh, these are some figures from the theoretical model that Sai et al. put together. Um, and they predicted that the seismic power, um, which is shown on the y-axis in these middle panels, um, being uh, changing as a function of frequency, depending on the distance away your seismic station is from the river, this is at 600 meters from the river, 200 meters from the river, as well as the Oops, sorry, as well as the um, grain size of material that would be impacting onto the bed. So the blue would be the, the smallest grain size that they had in their model and red being the largest grain size that they had in their model. Within this model um, and with the data that they used um, from that Himalayan river example, um, they were able to take the power spectral density from that data and use that to predict the bed load flux being moved um, during that period uh, in the river. Um, and they were able to do this without you know, putting samplers within the river to actually measure the bed load that's being moved. Additional studies have um, used the seismic data to try to separate out um, other things, such as the, uh, the signature of the water flow itself, rather than the, the bed load, the sediment that's being transported. 
Um, and then uh, also trying to remove the effect of precipitation. Uh, rainfall also can be captured in our seismic data. Um, and so trying to characterize the, the power and the frequency ranges over which that precipitation signal is present. Um, other studies have looked at um, bed load transport uh, followed by uh, debris flow um, that gets deposited within a river um, and how that changes the seismic signal as well. Um, there are many other studies and, um, you know, but it does, uh, the range of studies have shown that the seismic data has been very useful to be able to capture the various river processes. Um, I'll, I'll shift from the, the river examples um, that I just talked about to, to one other that I'll highlight towards the end of the talk, um, but it's another application of environmental seismology, um, and that is to use signals from ambient noise to be able to characterize um, changes in subsurface water levels, um, which is a particularly important topic in the Western US drought years. Um, and in this example that's shown here, um, uh, Clements and Denal looked at changes in seismic velocity over time um, as determined from these ambient noise cross correlations. Um, and they're looking at those velocity changes relative to changes in the water levels in the aquifer. So this example is from the San Gabriel Mountains, or San, sorry, San Gabriel Valley. Um, and they show during a period of, after a large precipitation event, um, negative dV over V changes indicating more water in the aquifer um, as compared to a time period uh, covering a, a large drought. Um, and you see these positive dV over V changes um, indicative of less water within the aquifer. And it's consistent also with uh, GPS uh, measurements showing uplift or, um, or down uh, dropping in that aquifer system uh, as well. So, you know, one of the important benefits to applying seismic data to this sort of problem is that um, you can get a broader um, scale of estimates relative just to just having a few wells where you're able to actually measure those water levels. So seismic data important for looking at these subsurface water levels. Okay, so um, uh, just to, to briefly give a, an outline for where we're going today, um, I've already covered a, a brief introduction to some of the environmental seismology applications. Um, and I'm gonna revisit a few of those applications. Um, and start with a review of some data that we've been collecting to look at bed load transport and water level changes. So we'll start with some data on flash floods within a central New Mexico tributary and how we're using seismic data with a unique observatory to try to understand bed load transport there. And finally, if I have a little time left, I'll highlight um, some work on um, some, some data that we've collected in a karst aquifer system in Florida to try to understand the structure and water flow in that system. We're gonna start by looking at the bed load monitoring. Um, and the examples that I've shown before um, today has uh, focused on high energy mountain rivers. And it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to look there. Uh, there's a lot of flow in these mountain rivers and they're very important erosive systems. But there are other areas that are important too. And what I'm gonna focus on is some flow in ephemeral channels. Um, and if you look at the globe and you think about you know, where are there dry and arid environments, they're very common around the world. Um, and that's shown here just in this map with the, the sort of red, orange, and yellow colors, uh, just measuring the dry and arid regions. If you're trying to measure material moving um, during flash floods in these very arid conditions, it can be very challenging. It's not continuous flow. So uh, they, they haven't been prioritized necessarily for continuous measurement. Um, in many cases, you need to get lucky with some of these flows in order to capture um, measurements in the channel if you're trying to record there. And so proxy measures such as seismic, um, you know, they have not been that common in these ephemeral channels either. Um, so it's a fairly data poor area to work in. So um, 
with some, some colleagues at New Mexico Tech and at uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel, um, we have a, a recently funded um, NSF BSF um, project that seeks to add a lot more data to this problem in two ephemeral desert channels, one in Israel, um, that's shown on the left, and one in New Mexico. What makes both of these areas really good targets is that they've both been outfitted with um, state-of-the-art instrumentation that provides both ground truth of the bed load flex, as well as a testing ground for a host of other proxy measures. Um, the idea is to find good proxies for bed load transport in these environments. So I'm going to focus mostly on data that we've been collecting in central New Mexico today, um, and that's at the Arroyo de los Pinos site. Um, but I do show the map for our site in Israel as well. So um, we'll focus here on the New Mexico site. Um, the research station here um, is located within a tributary of the Rio Grande River within central New Mexico. So the Rio Grande River itself is dammed uh, in several locations. So a lot of the sediment inputs into the river come from the various ephemeral tributaries that become active during the flash floods. They're generated during the intense southwestern US monsoon thunderstorms. So understanding the bed load movement in the tributaries is pretty important for river management of the Rio Grande. Um, and because of that importance, the US Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engin Engineers funded the construction of a state-of-the-art sediment transport observatory near the outlet of this tributary. So in the map here, we have the, the Rio Grande. Um, the shaded is our Arroyo de los Pinos Basin. Um, and we're going to look in detail at what is located at this red dot, which is our main um, outlet monitoring station. And there's an um, image of that monitoring station here. Um, and so we're gonna focus on uh, this little area that's in the yellow box next. So um, within the research station, um, the site contains a concrete sill, and that's what you can see here in this image, um, that's been emplaced within the channel. Um, and within that sill, we have several different instruments. Um, we have, and those instruments are shown, um, kind of outlined here, um, we have a pipe, pipe microphones, we have a plate geophone, um, and then we have these slot samplers, which are outlined here in red. Um, and I'll focus on those slot samplers here. Um, we have three of them that are contained within the cell. So um, within the channel, um, you can see what it typically looks like, dry. <laughs> um, the, uh, the slot sampler, you can see one of them is right here. So during floods, um, the bed load is car carried downstream um, and blue arrow is pointing in the downstream direction. Um, and so that material will, will flow and then fall um, into the slot. Um, that's an open slot, uh, 11 centimeters long. Um, that material will fall um, into the, the steel chamber that's below. Um, within the chamber, we have pressure transducers um, that record the mass accumulation over time. So it gives us a record of the bed load transport. Um, and the picture over here on the right shows the state of the channel after a flood has come through. Um, and they can see the associated uh, sediment deposit left there after the flood. So in addition to the data collection at the outlet station, um, we also collect other data upstream. Um, so we have uh, water depth or water level data uh, collected with pressure transducers, um, which are the little dots um, that we have throughout the basin. Uh, we also have various rain gauges upstream um, so that we can get uh, amount of rainfall that data also collected um, through the basin. Uh, we also capture the radar images of the storms and we have quick moving graduate students that, <laughs> that get out there um, to help us capture other data such as um, video uh, during actual floods. So, um, you know, we can capture the, the 
material that's actually flowing um, and, and being deposited as it falls into our slots. Um, but we also um, can use the water depth measurements um, because they allow us to estimate the bed shear stress, which is also related to the bed load flux. Um, the equation for the bed shear stress uh, shown here, it's related to the water density, the hydraulic radius, gravity, and the channel slope, which we have measured um, the slope and the cross-sectional area very carefully. So we can then compute that hydraulic radius using those measured water depths. Um, and uh, the shear stress that we can calculate this way um, is uh, directly related to the uh, measured bed load flux that we can capture within those samplers. Um, so we see you know, higher shear stress going along with the higher levels of bed load flux. And why this is useful is that we can estimate these shear stress values at times after those slot samplers are full, um, which means that we can extend the record throughout the entire flood. So um, we've been collecting hydrologic data in various forms in the basin since 2017. Um, I'm gonna to focus today on activities last summer because we were very fortunate to capture um, a, a very active monsoon season. We had eight floods uh, in our system uh, one of them peaking out at about um, 1.2 meter water depth at the outlet. Um, so the hydrographs are shown here for our um, different flood events. Um, and uh, I'm also gonna note uh, the two different colors uh, lines here um, because they highlight the limitation on those bed load samplers. Those bed load samplers will fill up. Um, you know, so the, the red lines, the red part of the line is the time period uh, since the start of the flow that we captured data in the bed load samplers, the blue line indicates at flow after the samplers filled up. So um, you can see in a lot of these, there was a lot of the flood that was missed. So it highlights the need to develop these effective proxy measurements um, for trying to get at the bed load flux. So um, the proxy that I'm gonna highlight here is seismic. Um, so we have seismometers throughout the basin um, operating since 2018. Um, and this includes uh, broadband stations that we have located um, at the outlet, which is located here, as well as at three different upstream locations. Um, and then we also have uh, nodal seismometers, these short period um, instruments that are kind of all in one instruments uh, that we can deploy very close to the channel because of the simpler um, deployment strategies required for those. And so I'm going to focus on data collection from summer 2021 corresponding with that active uh, flood season. Um, this is the distribution of the stations that we had during that year. Um, we had most of the instruments located um, along the, the banks at the outlet station. Um, and then we had another concentration of stations um, at one of the upstream areas, uh, which is an area where we have changing lithology along and in the channel. Um, and then we had 10 nodes each at these other upstream locations. So um, in addition to capturing the flood events with the seismic data, we've also been using the seismic data to um, characterize the site conditions, um, namely the seismic velocity and attenuation as these are important parameters that go into that theoretic, theoretical model that links the bed, the bed load flux to the seismic noise. Um, so we've done a couple of uh, surveys, both at the outlet station and at the upstream sites, um, including some uh, sort of traditional hammer surveys, banging on a metal plate, um, as well as uh, some experiments where we've gone and we've dropped rocks at different parts, points in the channel of different sizes um, and had them recorded with our seismic data. Um, and I'll just gonna highlight a couple of the examples here um, with some of the rock drops that we did um, in a transect across the river. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a seismogram from one of those uh, rock dropping experiments where we dropped rocks of different diameters between one centimeter and 10 centimeters um, at the same location. Um, and you can see uh, we, we did capture um, all of those drops of the different sizes. Um, you can 
barely see the smallest one in the seismogram, you can certainly see it, um, evidence of it in the spectrogram here, um, even to the one centimeter diameter pebble. Um, and on the right, we just show the power spectral density at that station um, for each of the different sized rocks. Um, and you know they're, they're definitely visible over the background noise, which is shown here in the black dashed line. Um, and so this plot uh, just combines the data from all of the stations that we had out for this experiment, um, ranging in distance from two meters to 60 meters from the drop sites. Um, for the smallest rocks, uh, the one centimeter ones, um, those ones uh, you know, are, are visible only at the closest stations within a few meters. Um, but as we get up into the larger two to four centimeter pebbles, you start seeing them at some of the further away stations. Um, and then those largest pebbles, you can see them um, on all of the stations that we had out for this experiment. Um, and I'll note that for the largest of the 2021 floods, um, we do have a significant fraction of material at the greater than two centimeter diameter um, level. So also with this data, um, we can make estimates of the group and phase velocities that are associated um, with the impacts. Um, here's another seismogram for one station recording 10 different drops at five different locations within the channel. Um, so here I've just taken the envelope of that signal, um, looked at the time of the peak at, uh, for that particular impact, which I'm assuming reflects the fundamental node and then using that time to compute the velocity. And I've done this for various stations um, and various dropping sites um, and used all of this in combination to estimate the group and the phase velocities as a function of frequency for the site. Um, and these velocities are, um, are lower than we've seen in some of the other papers that have been published in, um, in environments where there's lots of bedrock. We have a lot of alluvium, alluvium and so um, the velocities that we're finding for the site are um, lower than what we're pulling out from some of the other environmental seismology literature. And that's important because we need to use those for the theoretical models. In addition, um, we've used this data to estimate the attenuation at the site. Um, and here I'm just using uh, the normalized power times the distance um, during the the drop relative to the lowest power times the distance to estimate Q or the quality factor as a function of frequency. Um, and the example here is just a plot of that for a, a narrow frequency band around 43 hertz. Um, we can combine this for a range of frequencies um, and look at how that Q, that quality factor, varies as a function of frequency. Um, for our outlet site, a Q of about 25 um, looks to be pretty reasonable over the frequency range of interest um, that we're working in. And those values of Q are, are somewhat similar to uh, some other river studies um, that have been published. Okay, so now that we have some of the key site parameters. Um, we can move on to pull out the seismic noise that's related to the bed load transport. And I'll note that a lot of this work coming up is, is that of my master's student, Mitchell McLaughlin. Um, so a lot of the figures are his. <laughs> Just want to uh, acknowledge that. Um, and so here we can see that um, we have got a seismogram from one of the stations that captured a few hours um, with one of our 2021 floods that are clearly visible. Um, the middle panel shows the record of the water depth in blue. It was recorded at the outlet site, which is very close to this particular seismic station. And then the bottom is the spectrogram of that seismic data. Um, and you can see clearly elevated power over a range of frequencies. The question is, what is the right range to use um, that tells us about the bed load? So we can look at some other river studies for some guidance. Um, the couple of examples are shown here. Um, all of these studies uh, basically put the bed load transport frequency range um, somewhere greater than about 20 hertz, um, at least you know, higher than frequencies where they've suggested 
the signal from the water flow would be contained. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at these higher, higher than about 20 um, hertz range uh, is something that we're going to start with. Um, but we also need to look carefully at the noise sources that are present in our data and our environment um, to more clearly refine that frequency range. Um, and so before, before jumping in there, just um, a quick mention of, of the processing that we're doing. Um, so we're taking our velocity seismograms um, that cover the flood periods. We apply a filter to keep frequencies above one hertz um, and separate them into one minute long windows. We compute the power spectral densities by taking the Fourier transform of these overlapping windows, average them, and then convert to decibels. Um, and so then within uh, specific frequency bands, uh, we'll take the median power, and then it's that median power that we're going to compare with some of the other data sets. So um, for our data, uh, we know that we have rainfall that occurs um, in order to trigger the flash floods. Um, we've looked at the median seismic power in a range of frequencies here between 20 and 40 hertz on the left, um, between 180 and 200 hertz on the right. Um, and we see a positive relationship between um, rainfall and power at all the frequencies. Um, the, it does appear to be uh, uh, stronger at the higher frequencies. Um, and the, the tricky thing about the rainfall is that it's, um, it does vary with station, um, particularly with the depth of burial, the lithology at the site, um, and the details of the storm. Um, because if we capture the radar images, we know that it's not raining at all of the locations all of the time um, during these flood events. Um, at the low frequency end, um, we know we have noise from people. Um, and so um, these do seem to be concentrated at the lower frequencies. Um, we see uh, daily cycles of power between two and eight hertz. Um, and you know, we see these low values at the, the sort of late night hours. Um, I think that's related to the, the cars on the, the highways that are um, nearby. We also um, have trains, uh, we have train lines that are nearby um, and we have, you know, my poor student has to listen for when he hears trains <laughs> and mark down the time. So we know um, when the trains are going by. Um, so this is just one example of one of the train signals. Um, typically the, that's within about one to 10 Hertz um, with some bleeding up into the nearly 20 Hertz range. Um, but so then to, to further nail down the best range of frequencies to use, um, we can go back to those ground truth data sets that we collected our data or our site um, and find the range that has the best correlation to these parameters. So just as a reminder, you know, we collect the actual bed load that's moving um, in our slot samplers during the flood. Um, and then we also collect the water level depth or the water depth um, measurements with the pressure transducers located at the outlet site um, and upstream. Um, and these are all automatically recorded within the channel, which are better ways than just sending our graduate students out <laughs> into the channel during the floods. Um, but thank you, Kyle, for being willing to go out there sometimes. Um, so if we uh, take the measurements of the bed load flux, um, what we can do is uh, look at, um, test a range of frequency bands over which we relate the median power within a, a band to the measured bed load flux over time. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're taking all of the bed load flux that we have over several years, um, and we track the linear regression R squared of the fit within that particular frequency band. Um, and you know, this plot on the, the right is just an example of that for one particular flood. So this is just median power between a frequency range here, 30 to 80 Hertz um, as a function of measured bed load flux. Um, and so you can see um, it's a pretty good fit for that particular flood um, with an R squared of about 0.92. 
Um, and this is capturing about 24 minutes uh, after the flood arrived, right, where we have that bed load measurements. So, um, you know, we have really good linear fit to this one. What we've done is just aggregated all of the bed load data that we had um, and tested a range of frequency bands. Um, and the results of that is shown here on the left. Um, and uh, what we've narrowed this down to is focusing on the frequency range between 30 and 80 hertz as providing um, the best fit to the actual measured bed load flux data. Um, you know, we'll just look thinking about this uh, fit to the one particular flood um, that's shown here. Uh, the plot on the, the right is the comparison with the measured bed load flux, um, but we can uh, extend out the view of that flood um, throughout the entire flood. So again, the plot on the right is that comparison of the power with bed load flux until the samplers filled up to the first about 24 minutes. Um, if we instead use the bed shear stress um, to compare with our seismic data, we see um, this plot on the left where um, we're now comparing that to the shear stress. And we can use this uh, comparison throughout the entire extent of the flood, so 300 minutes of that flood. Um, again, we find very good correlation between the, the median seismic power between 30 and 80 hertz and that shear stress. Um, and we see uh, in detail, right, that as the flood starts, um, we get this increase in the seismic power. Um, and then it starts to decline during the falling limb of the flood. Um, and then go as you get later and later into the flood, um, those water levels are dropping, um, you're getting uh, lower shear stresses and lower um, seismic noise, seismic power um, in these frequency bands. So um, we're working through uh, still all of the flood events from last summer. Um, so again, we had um, many stations out throughout the basin. So you know, we're trying to look at the data from different locations to try to understand the effects of the lithology, and the localized channel morphology. Um, but what I have here is just the compilation of data that was captured on the longest running uh, broadband station at the outlet site. Um, so this includes floods going back to 2018. Um, and <coughs> it's uh, looking at the seismic power between 30 and 80 Hertz as a function of the measured bed load flux. Um, Given the range of events, um, it is still a good correlation of almost 0.7 um, R squared value here. Um, but you can see the different dot colors are different flood events. Um, and there are clearly differences um, between some of the floods, um, such as the, the last one from this most recent season, um, is significantly lower power um, for a given bed load flux than what we saw earlier in the season. Um, and some of this might be due to changes within the channel, um, the grain size distribution that was available um, to be moved during a given flood. Um, and these are all issues that we're working on um, throughout uh, this process. Um, we can do a similar comparison between the median power, um, but here we're using the bed shear stress. So that will cover the entire um, flood period. And, um, you know, again, it, it's the, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting detail in here. Um, you know, we do see roughly this linear relationship between power and, and shear stress, um, but there are clear differences uh, in the slope of that relationship um, for different um, shear stresses that we see for some of the floods, um, where it seems like it changes at the lower shear stress as, um, to something different as you get up to the higher shear stresses. Um, and so here again, we're working very closely with the geomorphologists and the hydrologists to try to understand the causes of those cha changes and how they might be related to, to what we're seeing change within the channel itself. Um, another uh, area that we're, we're working on is um, thinking back to some of the existing theoretical models that predict the bed load flux from the seismic noise. 
um, that were developed for these high energy rivers. And so the first model that we've considered is that um, model from CIDAL 2012 um, that I had uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and, you know, again, that one was, if you take the measured uh, power spectral densities, you could predict the bed load um, associated with that seismic power. Um, if we apply this model to the seismic data that we've collected, um, the observed power spectral density is shown here in this red for this flood. The green dots are the observed uh, bed load flux that we measure in the samplers. Um, but the model prediction of the bed load flux uh, is, is very low. Um, so we're under predicting the bed load flux um, relative to the observed data. Um, and this suggests that uh, we may need to do some modifications to these models um, that you know, we, we should consider for our specific environment. Um, and this is work that's being done by one of our hydrology students, a PhD student there. Um, and there are a variety of possible modifications that we can do, um, but one that we're examining first is one of the assumptions in that model that's um, that we only have saltating particles. So the particles are only vertically dropping um, and that's vertical impact is what's leading to the seismic waves that we record. Um, so you know, we're looking at ways to incorporate other transport mechanisms such as um, rock rolling or sliding uh, along the channel into the model. Um, and so we also did some field experiments to capture the, uh, the seismic signal of rolling versus vertical drops. I don't know why this video doesn't always work. Um, and so I had some students uh, and faculty out uh, where we put a string of rocks together um, and had them uh, basically pull this so that we could mimic the signal of rolling rocks rather than just dropping rocks vertically. Um, so that we could compare that to some of the uh, implementations within this model. So um, we, we have some of that data um, as another data source uh, in our similar environment or experiment set up in Israel. Um, we've also put out some smart rocks that have embedded accelerometers in them and also did some RFID tagging of some rocks in the channel so that we can better understand um, which rocks are actually moving. Um, during the floods and with the accelerometer data, how they're moving um, during the flood events. So, um, you know, more, more data to come on, uh, on some of these transport mechanisms that we use in these models. Um, okay, but uh, to wrap up this section of the talk, um, I just want to highlight some of the ongoing work at the site. Um, many students have been working uh, hard to characterize the grain size distribution of, um, from each of the flood events so that we can incorporate that with the seismic data. Um, I'm also looking at a variety of other signals within our seismic data that are um, unique to the events of last summer. Uh, we had several large floods uh, that led to a sudden ba bank collapse. Um, and the evidence as shown here in this drone-based uh, DEM, which shows the difference in elevation over the season. Um, and so we had in some areas of the outlet station, um, some pretty significant bank loss of over um, five meters. Uh, they were captured uh, very close, uh, worryingly so, <laughs> to the seismometers. Um, one student is also um, interested in trying to build a, an algorithm to detect upstream floods um, using the seismic data. And then we have um, another flood season to get ready for. So we're um, getting the planning going for um, the deployments for this season. Um, with the last uh, five minutes of the talk today, um, I wanna just really briefly highlight um, some other of my watery projects. <laughs> um, and that's some work that we're doing to explore a complex karst um, aquifer system. So karst aquifers, they're important areas for uh, water resources, um, yet they also are fairly complex um, with the, the subsurface conduits and the interactions with water between the conduits and the matrix. So I've been involved in a joint um, seismic, geodetic, hydrology, geochemistry study to look at ways to better characterize the conduit system 
and underst understand the flow through the, these parsed aquifer systems. Um, and this was work uh, in collaboration with Wheaton College, University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the University of Florida. Um, this experiment is in uh, northern Florida uh, within the Olino and River Rise uh, Preserve State Parks. Um, it's a location where um, we have actually um, pretty good maps of the conduit system, um, where the conduit, mapped conduits are shown here in red. Um, and this is an area where um, the Santa Fe River comes in, uh, sinks down um, into a, a sinkhole here at River Sink, um, travels within the subsurface conduit system, um, and then comes back out uh, about four kilometers to the south um, to then travel again on the surface. Um, we collected uh, three years of, of seismic, hydrologic, and tilt data in this region. Um, and those sites are shown here on the map. Um, this is just a, a map or a picture of the, the river sink area. Um, this project took a, a pretty massive field effort um, where we had a variety of students out to deploy um, and service seismic and tilt stations, uh, where some folks are doing that here, um, collecting uh, water levels. Uh, and then we also did a, a hammer survey here. Um, so lots of students to help us with that. We also had a variety of field visitors um, like uh, rattlesnakes, uh, wild pigs, and alligators at our field site. So um, our data collection spanned um, a range of different water levels, so different aquifer recharge periods. Um, and this plot just shows the water level over a subset of the period of the deployment. Um, and so we can look at um, the seismic and tilt signatures of the changes in water levels um, within the system. Um, and uh, you know, a, a month period here um, highlighted in red um, just shows uh, some of the seismic data that we had um, during one of these recharge uh, episodes at two of the stations um, that are uh, sitting above this conduit system. Um, and so, you know, again, we need to consider the range of noise sources uh, before we try to identify a frequency band to compare to the water level data. Uh, and this was some work um, that was done with an undergrad intern where he was looking at periods of high winds because we had a weather station there, precipitation, and also traffic. Um, and then trying to characterize the noise or the sources, the frequency band of those noise sources. Um, and so he had, had kind of tried to outline the frequency ranges for these particular noise sources. Um, and so if we eliminate those, um, we do see a band of higher power pretty consistently through this period um, that wasn't necessarily tied to these noise sources. Um, and that was this band at about 12 to 20 hertz. So um, we've compared the, the median power in those frequency ranges with the discharge measured at one of the sites. Um, and that's what's shown here. Um, so median power in 12 to 18 hertz as a function of discharge. Um, and uh, you know there is a decent linear fit between those. Um, we still need to explore this for other periods of the larger water level changes, but the seismic data may indicate a promising avenue for trying to estimate the water level changes within the aquifer um, in this region, rather than just um, having to rely on simple point measurements at the wells. Um, another thing um, that we've been doing with this data, uh, we also in, in incorporated a, a, a denser nodal deployment in certain sections of the park. Um, and uh, my postdoc uh, is currently working on um, de determining uh, temporal velocity changes, similar to the, the uh, drought um, application that I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, as well as doing some tomography in the area using um, ambient noise cross correlations with the nodal data. So um, just to, to wrap up, um, you know, I, I've got a couple of main points here on the slide, but 
Um, I just want to highlight how much fun it's been um, dipping my toes into the environmental seismology area because um, it's been a great way to get my, both myself and uh, a lot of students out in the field, um, as well as really getting um, engaged with the scientists that are focused on these active um, surface processes for some other societally relevant um, problems. Um, and then I just also want to um, highlight and acknowledge uh, the, the many other students and other research, researchers who've been um, really important in working on these problems. So with that, um, I will uh, take any questions that you have. Um, and for those that might watch later, um, I've just included my email address uh, at the bottom if you have any other questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Susan, for this uh, wonderful talk. and. Well, uh, many eye-opening data sets for me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand or type your uh, questions into the chat. Okay, I see Tianzhe. Uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Suzanne, for the great talk. Um, I probably missed it. Uh, so you, you define the shear stress or basal shear stress in your talk and compare it with your seismic results. And I didn't quite, I didn't quite know how it is defined and uh, how it is measured. Yeah, so uh, let me go back to that slide. I mean, the key parameter there um, is the, uh, the hydraulic radius and um, here we go. And um, we're getting that effectively by um, the water level uh, measurements that we get with the pressure transducers, right? So the bed shear stress, it's just the water density times the hydraulic radius times gravity times the channel slope. So, um, you know, we've done really detailed measurements of um, the channel shape and the channel slope. Right, so we know what that is. Um, the hydraulic radius is tied to the cross-sectional area of the, the channel. Um, and so we, we have the, the measurement of that, the, the shape of the channel. So um, with the water depths, we can use that to get at that hydraulic radius. Okay, so this, is, so this parameter is only defined, it's solely defined by the water, not the, the, the bed load. Because bad load is the, you know, the pebbles in the Correct. in the water, but this shear stress is irrelevant to to that. Um, well, yeah. So the the bed load is not tied directly into this shear stress equation, right? But we do have the measurements of shear stress and the measurements of the bed load flux, right? And that's what's shown here in this plot. So they are okay. related. So. You know, as there you've got higher shear stress, you've got more, you've got higher bed load flux. Okay, so can you further can you further um uh, tell us how uh so what so what's the so what shape of the channel can cause a higher or larger hydraulic radius because it seems to be uh you know a key parameter here. Yeah, so it's the ratio of the, the area and the hydro hydraulic radius, the ratio of the area and the, the, the wetted perimeter of the channel, right? So, um, you know, as, that, as the water depths get higher, right, it becomes uh, the hydraulic radius goes up. Oh, okay. So basically, a deeper water can transport more, can, more, can transport more material. Okay. Yeah. That Okay, gotcha, thanks. Yep, and um, you know, again, this is uh, working, I gotta work closely with the hydrologists because these are not, uh, <laughs> the, when I think of shear stress, I think of something different, right? As a oh, seismologist. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's been uh, kind of eye-opening for me to also get engaged in, uh, you know, some of the other terminology and, and just some of these other processes. Uh, Peter. Um, so it was a very interesting talk. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I enjoyed um, the video that showed uh, um, the rocks being uh, dragged uh, by a string. I saw you also were modeling uh, 
I'm rolling rocks. And <laughs> I was just curious how that was done. Um, you know, is that like, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, bowling balls? <laughs> um, we have students, you know, uh, lined up to, to roll rocks. How did that, that work? That would have actually been a really good idea. I, wish I would have thought about the bowling ball, but um, no, the, the video that didn't fully work, but um, that was actually our rolling experience experiment. So we actually, we drilled, uh, we grabbed a bunch, a range of rocks that we picked up in the channel, right? So trying to use in situ materials. Um, we drilled holes in them and then we strung them on that string and we had them separated so that they would actually roll separately along oh, I see. Okay. as that was being pulled. I did have one of the students just tie a rope around a rock and just drag it. So we do have the dragging experiments too. Um, and uh, yeah, just trying, I'm still working on, on trying to, to understand those signals from the, and differentiate the dragging versus the, the rolling um, right. experiments. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but it was fun to get out in the field. Yeah, no, it looked know. like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Roll some rocks and yeah. drop some rocks. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a question from Wei Yuan in the chat. Uh, what is the smart rock? Yeah, so these are um, kind of their composite uh, material uh, and they have a, a hole in them and you put in, in a little accel accelerometer. Um, and so you can take uh, basically the position of these things as they're moving. Um, and so we can try to get at whether, you know, are these things rolling? Are they saltating? Are they dragging um, with that data? I, my understanding is we have not had a flood yet where those smart rocks have mobilized, but we're hoping. How do you get them back? Let's say it got moved around by your rolling downstream. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh, we we send out students, and you know they <laughs> they need to you know we like paint them, spray paint them bright colors uh, so that you could hopefully find them um, after the after the flood. Um, the RFIT. RFID tags are a little bit easier, right? Because you can take your scanner and just walk down the channel and scan for them. But but they don't capture the uh, acceleration time series, right? So that you just know which particles are moving, not how they're moving. Um, any other questions? Okay, so if we have no more questions, let's thank Susan again for this very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, so we will have a few more uh, seminars the, uh, this semester, and uh, we hope to see you again at the same time next week. Uh, okay, thanks, Susan. All right, yeah, thank you all. Thank you.